it's officially live for the webinar. Welcome to this is a webinar hosted by Health to Harm Network. My name is Ryan Clover. I'm here uh, today with the topic of the webinar using FLIR cameras to show oil and gas air pollution. Seeing is believing. Welcome, Nadia. How's it going? Good. Hi, everybody. Great to see everyone. I'm excited to um, have you on the webinar series. So it's been great planning this so far. It's been fun to learn a, a, more about the the program, the Citizens Empowerment uh, Project. And it looks like there's already quite a few people in the chat. There's 30 people live right now and 120 that read. That's impressive. It's so cool. Yeah. So if you're on the chat right now, just let us know that you can hear us, right? Because we just turned on our our cameras and microphones. So jump in the chat and just let us know if you can hear us and where you're tuning in from. That would be really interesting. And I'm gonna get the slides ready. So Ron, hey Ron, how's it going? Rosemary in Massachusetts. Sarah, oh good, you can Delaware. hear us. Great. That's awesome. Buckingham, Virginia, PA, West Virginia, great. We're covering a wide range already, that's awesome. I'm gonna pull up the slides now. New York City, awesome. Let's see here, sharing the screen. <laughs> it always gets a little funny as we transition into the screen share. Cool, cool, great. Gloria, Doug, Heather, Wow, it's great to see so many people who are already here and on time too. It's 12.01, so we, we're committed to starting right at, right at 12. Um, the webinar goes until 12.30. So these are pretty brief, but they're very action-oriented and focused around getting you um, connected. Um, that's essentially what the network is all about. So uh, real quick, some logistical stuff. The session today will be recorded. So this URL that you're on right now, crowdcast.io, um, is where the replay is also going to be. So you can share this with people. It's not too late for people to jump in the webinar right now. But it's also where the hosted video recording is going to be. And you can use the chat to engage in real time. But you can also add questions to the questions area. And what's really cool about the questions is that they actually become bookmarks for the presentation. So even in the replay, we can jump ahead to answers to the questions that you have about uh, this topic. Um, so because there's that question area, it's right below the video, you can add them as soon as you have them. And then you can also look to see if somebody already asked a question and upvote it. So it's a pretty cool system that we're excited to use. We already have four questions in the question area right now. So um, check that out as well. All right, so I think I already said my name is Ryan Clover. I'm part of the Health to Harm operations team, and what we do is we're a small team, and we help the network access things like webinars. We provide services on the website. I do a lot of website stuff, website design, and I send emails with announcements and stuff like that. So you might have gotten emails from me announcing this webinar. So yeah, excited to meet. Everybody, I love it when people reply and um, and you know start the conversation there. So today's presentation, like I said, it's short, it's kind of action focused. You're gonna see how optical gas imaging works. You're gonna learn how visual evidence can be applied to reduce harm. Sorry about the little typo there, but <laughs> learn how visual evidence can be applied to reduce harm and get connected with the community empowerment project basically the project that is bringing these cameras to different communities to document the invisible pol air pollution. So the agenda, the structure of this webinar is we're gonna have the presentation um, from Nadia, a Q and A, and some additional resources at the end to help you get connected to this work. So as we jump right into it, I'm gonna turn the camera over and the mic. Over to Nadia. Hi, everybody. Um, great to see so many people on here from so all across the country, both places that are 
currently um, reeling under the impacts of oil and gas and have been for quite some time, and also some new places um, threatened by the growing infrastructure. And just to start, I want to apologize for my voice. I don't usually sound this deep and froggy, but fighting a cold. Um, so just uh, apologies if I have to stop and take a drink uh, occasionally. So um, I'm very happy here to be able to present to you today and many, many thanks to Halt the Harm um, and to Ryan for initiating this webinar. Um, it is focusing on our community empowerment project at Earthworks. And Earthworks is a um, national nonprofit organization that's been working in various forms for about 25 years to address the impacts of oil and gas um, development and mining. Um, we're based in DC, but we have staff all over the country. Um, I'm speaking to you today from New York State. Um, and we started the Community Empowerment Project about um, four years ago with the purchase of our first um, optical gas imaging camera, which is um, also known by its brand name of FLIR, or Forward Looking Infrared Camera. And that is the centerpiece of our community empowerment project, um, is to document and make the invisible visible, because with the naked eye emissions um, from, from uh, oil and gas facilities are generally uh, are generally invisible to the naked eye. So we, with this camera, we can make them visible. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about how we then can apply those videos and how they could be useful um, for all of you. And toward the end, I'll also introduce my uh, colleague, Molly Dutton, who coordinates the Community Empowerment Project. And she um, is the, the person of contact um, for requests for the, if you ever have questions about our videos. So Molly will be available to, during the Q&A as well. Okay, Ryan, I can take my first real slide. So first I, I wanted to just um, give a kind of an overview and many of you who live in oil and gas areas will, will know this all too well. Um, I wanted to, of just the pollution pathways and the way that we end up with um, air impacts from oil and gas development. And unfortunately, pollution results from virtually every part of the chain. Um, so from the wells themselves during um, drilling and production, uh, processing plants, compressor stations are a huge problem for people, venting tanks or improperly closed tanks um, that may contain liquids um, or waste products, um, any kind of valve that's open, equipment that's malfunctioning, engines from trucks and other equipment at the site, um, and then, of course, flaring and venting. Um, I saw in the chat box somebody mentioned flares that can be seen for miles. Um, that is a major problem. Um, operators do that to release gas, but with that comes a lot of pollution. Um, so the major concerns here are that the volatile organic compounds that are released have been are known and scientifically linked with health impacts such as headaches, eye, nose, and throat irritation, over time, increasing fatigue, aches and pains, and even neurological changes with, depending on the um, level and intensity of exposure and the types of chemicals that you're exposed to. Um, the other issue is that a lot of nitrogen oxides or NOx um, combine with VOCs and heat and sunlight to form ozone. And a lot of the country is already, doesn't meet federal air quality standards for ozone and ozone is a very established known problem um, that causes respiratory and cardiovascular impacts. And it's something that a lot of states and communities are already wrestling with, which in our minds begs the question, you know, if you're gonna put more development, more oil and gas development in, in areas that don't meet standards, you're just gonna have more and more ozone problems. And then the other side, so there's health and then there's climate. The other side is that methane is on a 20 year time scale is considered 86 times more potent, meaning it has that much more energy um, or, or greenhouse gas forcing potential than carbon dioxide. And so it's a serious greenhouse gas and climate concern. Um, and studies sh are increasingly showing, including one um, from NASA that was done um, earlier this year, show that oil and gas development in North America is a key reason for an increase in, in atmospheric methane. So those are the pathways and that's with all of the development going on and the, 
the sort of somebody in the chat box mentioned a hot spot or being in a county in Colorado where there are 24,000 wells. Um, those kind of intense areas can really make a difference in terms of air quality. Okay, next slide. So the Community Empowerment Project, one of our, our top goals is to start connecting the dots between those pollution pathways, what people are experiencing on the ground, and what we believe operators and the government should actually be doing about it. Um, and we never say that fixing a problem at a particular site um, is going to fix the whole problem of oil and gas pollution. What we believe that everywhere there's a leak or a problem, it should be addressed because it does have um, impacts for people on the ground and it contributes to the, to the broader problems um, like climate. So the way we go about connecting the dots, our kind of theory of change, so to speak, is that we first go out with a camera um, to identify problems such as um, odor, uh, such as the pollution, and we talk to people on the ground about odors and health symptoms, what they're experiencing, what they think the likely sources are. We go out ourselves and, and note it. And then we film the emissions using our optical gas imaging or FLIR camera. And then Earthworks files complaints. We now have field staff in different states that file compa complaints, and we also work with residents like you all to file complaints as well. And those complaints, um, you know, every regulatory agency in the country has a, has a method to receive complaints. And those complaints can be based on your individual experiences, like, you know, I get a headache every time they flare, um, or I'm seeing, I'm hearing loud noises and then terrible odors. They can also be based on kind of regulate, regulatory hooks. Um, for example, the new um, methane methane rules that came out under the Obama administration that requires operators to fix leaks. They can be based on local and state ordinances, for example, around not allowing pollution to escape a facility. So if we see something going, pollution going over a fence line, that could be a violation. So our goal here is to document and expose industry practices, pollution, start tracking some of the worst bad actors and repeat offenders. And then what we ultimately are trying to do here is to demand accountability. Um, so we hope that the videos that we can provide um, can be used by folks like you to go to local officials in the media. Um, we will also work to, to make that happen. We're, always, we're often sending our videos out to the media. Um, then we are, our field staff are maintaining communication with regulators to push them to, make, to do more inspections and issue violations. Again, this is about accountability. And over time, we believe that operators, um, if they are required to change practices and permits, the price for them of doing business gets more expensive, but it also leads to pollution reductions. And that is critical for people on the ground. Um, and we also know that by being out there and filing complaints and working with communities, once regulators and operators know that we're out there watching them, and filming what they do, um, they are more um, likely to take action because they've been operating with impunity, impunity and I would say arrogance for, for a very long time. So the more that all of us collectively can make a ruckus, the better. Um, next slide, please. So to date, um, we have field staff in several states. Um, we focus in on particular states, but we try to respond to requests from communities wherever they are. Um, and to date, since 2014, we have visited about 1,000 oil and gas sites in 15 U.S. states, Canada and Mexico. Um, we've produced, um, I think this number is a little bit out of date, but with over 600 optical gas imaging videos and, um, and 90 uh, resonant stories. We like to film folks who are willing to share their stories and put that, we have a map that we're in the process of improving, um, but you can go into that map on our website and I'll share the link in a little bit and you can you know, put in your information and then find out where we've been in your area. Um, we have, our work has um, led to nearly 100 complaints that have been filed um, to the state to state agencies and in a few cases to the um, US Environmental Protection Agency. And then um, we have seen some violations issued as a result of our work. 
We're going to keep be keeping track of this over time as we ramp up. Um, and some of those violations and some of those actions by inspectors have led to operators being required to put on stronger pollution controls and to increase to, to make permit requirements more stringent. And um, over time, again, you know, we really do see that our the impact of this and what we hope to achieve by working with, with residents is to provide visual evidence of harm. Um, too many people on the front lines of oil and gas development are often told, well, you're just imagining it. It's not really an issue. It's just a, a fluke. It's an isolated event. And we're trying to counter that narrative and, as well as the broader narrative that, get, that gas development is clean. Um, so we believe that providing that visual evidence of harm um, can help residents. And again, you know, we wanna be a watchdog of industry and regulators so that they cannot continue to operate with total impunity. And another goal that we have is to actually do some me measurement of methane at the sites where we visit, try to combine that with some of our FLIR footage and start to get a better handle on what's actually coming out of these sites and um, how it could be reduced over time. Um, Ryan, now would be a great time to show one of our FLIR videos. I think uh, Molly had sent one to you earlier, if you wouldn't mind doing that. It's just a short Sounds video so good. you all can see what it actually looks like. Yeah, do you wanna start with this one? Yeah, that's terrific. This is um, one of our poster children. Um, one of our uh, camera operators happened to be driving by North Dakota where he was filming and heard this loud engine roar. So pointed his camera toward this pipeline where he heard the roar coming from. And this wow. is what he got. Um, so you could see sort of the before the naked eye, the image, and now this is what we capture on the FLIR camera. And the pollution plume um, just goes on and on. Um, and he went back about 24 hours later and it was still going on. Did he ever figure out what site that was? Um, I think he, yes, he did. And I think the reg the regulators were informed. Um, we unfortunately don't know how it was addressed in the end. Um, and then this next video um, will be familiar to many of you in the East. Um, it is actually of the XTO well blowout in Powhatan Point. Um, we happen to have a team out um, around the in the three week period that it was that this well was emitting. This is a well that they were fracking and it's still not known exactly what happened, but um, something went wrong and the entire well blew out and caused emissions that went on for about three weeks until they were able to, to plug it. Um, and we were out there just a few days before they finally plugged it. Um, and that's what we saw. So those are a couple of examples of, of, um, of what we do and the visual evidence that we can provide. Um, I think if you wanna to go to the next. So, um, and I should have said from the beginning that we are currently in a real ramp up phase um, with the community empowerment project. We got new funding um, about a year ago and we now have field staff in, new, in more states um, and we're working uh, in a much more sort of measured and planned way to develop this library of evidence and to work with communities. Um, and part of that is we're able to take requests from the front lines. Um, these are some um, resources for you. You can find information, links to our hundreds of videos from different states and different types of facilities. Um, and also there's a request form if you want us to try to come to your community and a paper on community air monitoring all at that link earthworksaction.org backslash CP. Um, and then there are different campaign playlists or state playlists and, um, and the map also to find out where the polluters are. And thank you, Ryan. That is the oil and gas threat map. Um, some of you may have heard about it. It's a collaboration that we did with Clean Air Task Force and Frack Tracker. And you can actually put your information in and get, it, get um, information on oil and gas wells and, um, and facilities and pollution risks and ozone and other issues um, for wherever you live. And that is a project that's ongoing that we're constantly adding videos to and new data to. Um, so I think I'll stop there and really look forward to the discussion and the Q&A. Maybe we can bring Molly on at this point.
Hi guys. All right. I was hanging out, hiding in the background. <laughs> and yeah, this is Molly Dutton, our uh, our esteemed CEP coordinator, um, who is uh, always answering requests. So she's here to help answer questions as well. Hi guys. Um, if you have more questions, please uh, put them in the, the chat box or the question box. Um, there's a couple questions that have come in, Nadia, already that I, I have taken the liberty of answering, but I think would be worth discussing a little more um, with folks on the call. Terrific. Um, the first question that I'd like to just chat a little bit more about came in from Rosemary about uh, wanting to bring or wanting to get FLIR camera technology to her community in Massachusetts, but seeing the sticker shock or having sticker shock at the price of the camera um, has prohibited them from being able to do that. Um, so as Nadia mentioned, um, the camera is an extremely expensive piece of technology. Um, and back in 2014, when Earthworks decided to get into this line of work, it, it was extremely important to us that we uh, make that technology available to communities because the cost of the camera is so high and because it does that price tag of $100,000 does prohibit uh, most communities around the country from being able to say buy their own camera. Um, so that's kind of why the Community Empowerment Project exists. We tried to put this technology in your hands um, so you can bypass having to fundraise for $100,000 um, and purchase a camera for yourself. Um, we can't be everywhere every time. So we ask that folks give us a little bit of um, patience and flexibility in terms of scheduling a trip to your area. But if you are really keen to have um, a visit by the FLIR camera in your community, I would highly recommend trying to work with us first before exploring um, purchasing or even renting a camera. Um, renting a camera is an option, but you have to keep in mind that a rental could be anywhere from five to $10,000 for one week. And you also have to pay for the time of a certified thermographer to operate the camera unless you have someone in your community or in your organization who is already certified um, as an opti optimal gas imaging thermographer. Um, so that's an answer to one question. I don't know, Nadia, if you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think that pretty much covers it. And um, you can always put in a request. Um, if, I know for a lot of folks who have new facilities coming online, like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline or, um, you know, a lot of the, the pipelines going in in New England, um, there's a huge con desire to get visual evidence of the problem. So what I would say is, since we can't actually film your facilities yet because they're not operational yet, um, we may be able to provide you with videos of sort of similar types or, you know, here are a sample of some compressor station videos or here's a sample of a pigging station um, from another state, which you might still be able to use in your campaigns. Um, so. Great. Um, the next question came in from Doug um, about, I'll just read the question. Are FLIR cameras sensitive enough to detect leaks in existing transmission lines? Um, I would say yes, it depends on, it all depends on the visibility of the equipment that's leaking and our ability to get close enough to that leak and to that source. Mm -hmm. um, the, the camera is extremely sensitive and can detect even a very small leak, um, but that all depends on our ability to really kind of get really, really close to the source. So really Naughty and I's job is, is, is a game of trying to get the best possible conditions to get to have the best possible chance of getting footage. Um, but it really, you know, we really rely on you all as our community partners to help us work out access to these sites, to maybe work with landowners in your community to allow us to come onto their property. If that's not an option, then we work really hard to, to find access routes that, you know, use public roads and things like that. Um, but basically, if we can get close enough to a given site, we can detect even the smallest leak. It really just is a matter of getting close and having kind of clear visibility. Um, and that's a question we get a lot because a lot of our videos are of, you know, big compressor station exhaust or um, dramatic venting events from a tank. Um, and that doesn't, um, those videos kind of stand out to a lot of folks, but that doesn't mean to say that we don't also do a lot of filming of these sort of smaller leaks and smaller sources. So that was a great question, Doug. Um, 
I there's a couple questions here that have recently come in at the bottom that I did not get a chance to respond to. Um, have we used these cameras on injection wells? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, obviously, the well needs to be they need to be actively injecting for there to be anything for us to film at the time. So injection wells can be a little tricky for us to film. Um, but if the site is active while we are there, then there's a really good chance that we will get some sort of emissions um, showing up in the video of that site. Um, Nadia, there's a question for you from Susanna on where did we get our funding and how much did we pay for the camera? Yeah, well, as Molly <laughs> just mentioned, um, the cameras run about $100,000 and then there's training um, involved of the thermographers and um, and also keeping up with the technology. There's, you know, these are these cameras are heavily insured. <laughs> and then there's a lot all the travel that's involved in these trips. Um, so a lot of our funding for the initial phase of CEP came from generous donors um, and people who fundraised. We didn't, you know, just wake up one morning and say, let's go buy a FLIR camera. We actually had a concerted um, fundraising campaign and effort for a couple of years before we were able um, to get our first camera. And then thanks to the support of generous donors, we were able to get our second one. We're currently, um, for the last year, operating under a very generous grant from the MacArthur Foundation um, to do tracking of these emissions and, pro and operational problems. Um, and it's a climate oriented grant. So we're really, that's where the methane measurement and the methane tracking and emissions profiling at different types of facility, um, where those kind of efforts come in. Um, so it has enabled us to really ramp up our operations and get out to more communities and, um, and cover more facilities. Great, um, I just saw a question come in from Steven. Can this technology also be applied to landfills, incinerators, and waste processing sites as well? Well, I would say that possibly if there was a very clearly identified um, methane leak because the camera is calibrated to detect 26 or so gases and a main one is methane. Um, but just like with the injection wells, you'd need to have that at a place where a place and time and access where you would actually be have emissions coming out. And that can be trickier. Um, even well sites can be tricky, right? You, you can hear them, you know, something's happening, but unless they're like in active production or have engines running on the well site, we might not see anything. So while we see pollution virtually everywhere we go, that doesn't mean we see it every site, every time. Um, so I think things like waste processing facilities and landfills would be even tougher. Um, it's not something that we are focusing on right now because we're really focused on oil and gas, um, but it is certainly, you know, potentially works. There may even be a smaller or more sensitive instrumentation from FLIR um, that makes these optical gas imaging tools more for that approach. Um, and we just got, oh, we're getting some more questions coming in. This is great. Um, aside from assisting regulators in determining violations, have or can these videos be used as evidence in court? Um, yes. Yes. And I would just. Yes. In fact, that's part of the reason we provide them to you all. Absolutely. Um, if, you have, um, if you have court cases underway or you, and, and actually in the state of Texas, um, we, we submit complaints. They require affidavits if you want the information to be used as um, evidence that could potentially be used in a violation, inspection, um, and potential legal action if you want it to be legally binding. So that's an area that our, our thermographer in Texas has been, has been looking into because, and it's part of the reason that we're really pretty hardcore about having only our certified, trained optical gas imaging um, camera operators um, using the camera and submitting, having, you know, their name and their statements on the complaints that we file. Um, because this is the same technology that the industry and regulators use. And we want everyone to know that we are using the same technology with the same type of training. And so it is credible evidence of pollution. 
I don't know, Ryan, are we running out of time or do we have more time for questions? So it's just about 1230, which is around when we wrap up. We definitely have more time to answer questions, but I just wanted everybody to know who's on the webinar. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to stick around and, and keep talking. Um, for anyone who has to go, what would be the next step for them to get involved in the project? I'd say the next step would be to check out our CP page um, with the information that's there. Um, maybe we can put that resource slide back up. I don't know if that's possible with all of us on there. Yeah, um, and one thing too is after the webinar, I'll send you a link to the replay that you can use, that you can share with other people if you want to, but also we can include the, you know, everything from that slide in that email as well. Terrific, so, and the other thing yeah. I would say is, you know, we're doing this project, but there's nothing that precludes all of you from doing your own community empowerment projects using that concept in your own in your own areas. Um, mm. I mean, the camera is our centerpiece. That's how it works. But you, all of you, filing complaints, hammering on regulators, and I know it's a thankless activity sometimes, and it's very frustrating. After years of the shale boom, there's still much less response than communities deserve. But keeping up with that um, and and complaining as often as you need to um, until you get some accountability um, is also a way to engage in this concept. Um, and then reach out to Molly, submit a request, and we'll try to fulfill it um, when we can. <laughs> so. Yeah, the first step to getting the FLIR camera in your community is just reaching out to Earthworks. We have a community empowerment project request form on our Earthworks website that Ryan already put in the chat box for us, but it sounds like we'll be recirculating the materials where you guys can find that link. Um, and basically it's just a really simple form where we ask you a couple questions about, you know, what's going on in your community, what kind of facilities do you have around you, um, when would you like us to come, you know, some simple questions like that. So a little bit of a homework assignment for you all, but it really helps us kind of have a first um, initial understanding of what you're going through. And then from there, I will reach out to you and try to get more information. If you live in a place like Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, California, Pennsylvania, or Ohio, we actually have field staff embedded in those states that can be more of an on-the-ground resource for you. In other states um, that we don't necessarily have a staff person, you will be taken care of by Earthworks at large. Um, and we sort of tag team with different states who kind of helps um, you know, those efforts where we don't have field staff on the ground. Uh, but yeah, the first step to try to get the camera in your community is just reaching out to us. And again, it, we do have a lot of demand for the camera. Unfortunately, I wish that we were out of the job because that would mean that there wouldn't be a need for this technology. But unfortunately, there is. So I just, again, beg your, your patience and your flexibility with us around scheduling. Um, but we really do make it our mission to try to get to every place that we can, um, especially if there's a really demonstrated need for this kind of technology and for this um, for the community empowerment project. Mm -hmm. And I'll say one last thing before we jump into the rest of the questions, which is to make sure you check out healththeharm.net as well, because some of the services that we have besides the webinar service, um, like campaign support, crowdfunding, um, and the directory as well. The directory is a really important way to you can connect with other people in your region, but you can also search people based on their skills or their interests. So it's really easy to find a group of other people in the directory that are maybe also using these cameras or have used them in the past and just make those connections like that. And we do live on camera networking sessions on Fridays. And so that's the other thing too, is just connect with me if you wanna connect a little bit with that online networking side of things. Yeah, Halt the Harms mm. network of of resources um, for communities is pretty amazing, both live resources in the form of people and all the other information. So definitely underscore that. And I would also just say that if, if we have say three or four groups in a given state or place that are all kind of clamoring for our help, um, it is a lot easier for us to kind of make the space in our calendar to get out. You know, it can be very difficult mm. for us to justify a trip to an area that might only have a few wells when we have a lot of areas that we work in that have several wells. Not to say that anyone's plate is worse than, than someone else's, but for, for our, from where we stand, um, if you guys can kind of work together in your regions or even counties or even metropolitan like level and kind of get together and 
um, get in touch with us as a group, then that can help us be a little more responsive to, to the need. Um, we have a great awesome. question here that came in at the bottom, if we could jump to that, because it is the one that we get all the time. <laughs> which um, is? Which is, what exactly is the FLIR camera measuring? Is it just heat or steam sensing, or is it specific types of pollutions? Uh, pollution, it, excuse me. Yeah, it is um, calibrated, as I said earlier, to detect, um, I think we're, what, 26 gases, 24 gases. Uh, methane is one of them. We actually have a fact sheet on the camera and how it operates on our CP page. If you want to get, it's kind of a layperson's explanation of the technology, but it also has a link to the camera from FLIR, the manufacturer, um, which will explain how it works. And our videos do pick up heat as well, which is why our, our thermographers are trained again, um, you know, in making the distinction and understanding what the video that they're shooting actually shows us. And there are differences, um, like water vapor, for example, dissipates very quickly in the air. So if you see a pollution plume stretching out, going beyond the fence line, moving and moving, like the one from both in both the videos we showed you, that's not heat and that's not water vapor. Um, and we have increasingly been using something called a function on the camera called a temp spot or a temperature spot, which will show the difference between the ambient air temperature and the gases, which also demonstrates that it's not just air and not just vapor. Um, so there are different ways um, to use the technology to make those distinctions. It is the most frequently question we ask question we get. It is a way that industry has always pushed back on these videos um, and on optical gas imaging generally by saying it's just heat and steam. But yeah, there may be heat and steam in our video, but that's not all that's there. There's way more than that. And our, as Nadia said, our thermographers are trained to sort of interpret the footage um, and can work with you all on a specific site or video and say, okay, here, you know, that is the heat signature that you're seeing from the compressor engine. Here is the plume of emissions that we're concerned about. Um, and so we can work with you guys to sort of, um, again, interpret what the footage is actually showing us, but we do uh, like to push back on the idea that this is only showing us heat and steam because this is a camera that is specifically calibrated to visualize hydrocarbons. It also happens to pick up heat because it is infrared technology. Um, but we, again, we have to keep in mind that this camera is specifically built for the purpose of visualizing hydrocarbons and VOCs, including you know, things like methane. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, this was a good question, I thought, from Carol. Can blood testing for harmful compounds reinforce the camera images? That um, is a really cool question. Um, and we've been part of our part of our um, journey in figuring out how we actually measure methane or determine what we're seeing and what VOCs would be coming out um, is about how we interpret the images and, and how much we can rely on the images. I think those are two really separate issues though, because what the camera and the images are showing you is what's potentially what's in the air, but it's not telling you whether it's methane or benzene or ethyl benzene or any of the suite um, of contaminants that are probably in the air due to oil and gas development. So it's showing you that the pollution is present. It's potentially like we're working on useful to understand a volume and the duration of the emissions. But a blood test, just like an air sample, um, tells you what the concentrations are of very specific contaminants in your system and they're health oriented. And that's kind of a different function. So the camera will tell you there's stuff in your air and what you're breathing and the symptoms you're having are not imagined because yes, there's stuff in your air that you're potentially exposed to, but to understand those exposures is why you would rely on a, on a blood test. So it's, it's not quite apples and oranges, but they're very, very different um, reasons that, that those two um, types of monitoring exist. Mm. Thanks, Nadia, that was a great answer. Um, we have a lot of different questions kind of coming through about this type of site or that type of site. And I just want to um, reiterate something that Nadia said earlier, that is we have a lot of videos 
and we have a lot of videos of a lot of different types of oil and gas facilities and infrastructure. Um, anything from a fracking site to a pipeline to a processing plant to a compressor station to an ejection well to underground storage, we've pretty much filmed it all at this point. So there's a really good chance that if you guys are fighting a project in your community or dealing with a compressor in your town, there's a good chance that we have some footage that might already be helpful to you, um, whether it be from the same operator or just a similar type of facility or something that's already from your county or your state. There's a lot of stuff that we might already be able to provide you. Um, and if you guys just want to reach out to Earthworks or search our YouTube channel, which is just, you know, go on YouTube and look for Earthworks. Um, there's a lot of great resources already out there and we can kind of help you connect the dots to the local fight in your community. And so I would just say, you know, if we can't get out to you guys next week or even next month, uh, we we would be happy to work with you um, to try to kind of leverage the existing resources and videos that we already have. And a lot of the great research that Earthwork staff like Nadia have done on not just the footage, but also the impacts on these types from these types of facilities. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for folks that if you have you know, questions about what does an ejection well look like, you know, from the FLIR camera, we can help you answer that question. Great. Um, do you guys want us to keep going or should we wrap it there? <laughs> what do you say, Ryan? Um, I mean, we have more time and everybody's welcome to leave if they if they have to head out. I want to respect your time as well. And I feel um, like we can also I'm answer good. questions I'm good. You know, in the comments here too, so. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, there was a question about from Maydean or Maydean about particulates and particulate matter and how do we measure this? Um, yeah. And that is something that can be can be kind of a, a, a difficult thing for the FLIR camera. Um, unfortunately, when there is, for example, one of our camera operators was just out in West Texas. Um, it was a very dry week. There was a lot of dust blowing around in the air. Um, there was also a lot of frac sand mining going on, so there was just all kinds of stuff blowing around. That can actually compromise our ability to get good footage. Um, so with regard to particulate matter that might be coming from a specific site, um, I would maybe pump that question over to Nadia, but I do know that, again, the camera is specifically calibrated to visualize gases um, and hydrocarbons, so it's not, the particulate matter question can be a little tricky and and frankly, sometimes it can actually confuse the camera a little bit. So we try to not use those videos that might have a lot of dust in the air because we work really hard to put out videos that are not misleading um, and that we feel really confident you know, about what the video is showing. Um, yes. Nadia, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, so I, yeah. I think this is similar to the blood test question too, is that it's really un important to understand what the camera does and what its limitations are. And that's been a little bit hard for us to accept as well, that it has its limitations. And one of its biggest limitations is that it doesn't measure the pollution. It is filming the pollution, it is showing evidence of the pollution. But if you want to measure, and it and particulate matter is not a gas, so it wouldn't include that in its spectrum, um, which is probably also why it interferes with the video. Um, but if you want to measure particulate matter, you need a, a technology that does that. Um, and the, for example, the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project has been a real leader in getting what are called these spec monitors that were developed by Carnegie Mellon University out to individuals that monitor particulate matter and show spikes um, that may be the result of, of oil and gas operations. Um, and there's lots of other air monitoring technologies that communities can employ um, if you want to measure that. Um, but the camera doesn't measure and it wouldn't pick up particulate matter. Mm. Um, we just got another question from Candace. Are there, are there any less expensive pretest options that might establish a suspicion before the investment in the FLIR camera? And do you mean a suspicion of, so if you mean a suspicion of pollution existing, um, I think odors is an incredible filter. Um, well, actually it's not a filter, that's the problem. Um, but if you are smelling certain odors, there are, t there are certain sort of known odors that are associated with certain gases like mercaptan, um, which would rep is the odorizer that they put in natural gas. If you're smelling that, it's probably a leak of, of methane um, predominantly. 
Um, this kind of rotten egg smell is often associated with sulfurs, sulfur gases like hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide. Um, so odors, if you are smelling odors from a facility, there is pollution in your, that, that you are picking up. Um, so I would say that's your nose is the best, um, is the best pre-screening tool out there. And unfortunately, because by the time you're smelling it, you're probably getting the impacts. That's something else I would add. You know, if, if, if people in your household or in your neighborhood are experiencing health impacts or, you know, negative symptoms in any way, um, a lot of the common symptoms that you all are probably well aware of are, you know, itchy throat, um, increased respiratory symptoms. So maybe your asthma has gotten worse or you never had asthma before and now you do have asthma. Um, in children, sometimes we see nosebleeds. Um, some families complain about brain fog, which just means kind of being generally out of it. Um, if you guys are experiencing those types of symptoms, there's a really good chance that there is something in the air. Um, and there's a really good chance that it's probably coming from the oil and gas operation nearby. Um, so again, I think what Nadia said about odors, that's almost, that's almost always the first question I ask people, are you smelling things? And if you're smelling things, when, how often, um, and do you have an idea of where it's coming from? Um, and again, if there's any kind of health symptoms that you think are attributed, attributable to the oil and gas operations, then those are really good indications for us that there, there, there should be something that we could pick up with the FLIR camera. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always a tried and true methodology. It's not very scientific, but that is usually our best um, kind of initial filter um, to, to figure out if it's worth going to a given community. Um, but that's not to say that if you're not smelling odors, there's nothing there. So right. it's kind of a it's kind of a catch twenty two in some right. ways. Um, we got a question from Roxanne about um, can the FLIR camera pick up emissions from holding tanks before injection? Mm. And I, I would say that if there's some kind of leak in the tank, or there's the tank is not covered, or there's something wrong with the integrity of the tank itself, then there's a chance that we might be able to, to film something. Um, but if, if the, the site is the tank would need to be full. It would need to be um, full, and it would to need to have something wrong with it. Yeah. or some other situation. So, as Molly indicated before, with an injection well, um, something needs to be happening, and it's the same. We we hit the same problem with pigging um, stations. You know, when they're cleaning out pipelines, um, and with um, metering metering regulator stations um, when their gas is passing through, there has to actually be something happening and in the system. Um, for emissions to be created. Another so. good example is liquids offloading. Um, we don't, you know, we can film emissions from the actual offloading process, um, but if there's no truck that's there offloading liquids, then there's nothing really for us to film. So those types of facilities are a little bit trickier, but again, if you as a, as a community member or you as a group of folks in a community are kind of keeping tabs on when these sites seem to be more active, that's all really valuable intel for us. Um, sometimes th sites are more active at night. Sometimes they're more active on the weekends. It really sort of depends on a given area or a given operator. But um, you all are living with a lot of this stuff. So I imagine that folks are keeping kind of unofficial record of, of when you're noticing more trucks on the road, maybe when you're smelling more things, maybe when you're hearing more activity on a given site. And all of that information, if you could bring that to us, is really helpful when we're trying to figure out, you know, what our response plan looks like. Um, I think, ah, we got a question about low-flying planes and FLIR from planes. <laughs> That's funny because we're currently planning a helicopter trip. Um, yes, we can use the FLIR camera from the sky, and we've done that in a few situations. Um, it's tricky. It's not, it's not as uh, guaranteed as on the ground surveillance. Um, helicopters are generally preferred to small aircraft because they have the ability to kind of hover um, and hang out and allow the camera operator to really get, you know, get good eyes on a, a given site or source. Um, but yes, we've done both. We've taken the FLIR camera up in helicopters and lo like low flying small aircraft. Um, and what we've seen is when the emissions are large enough in quantity um, or in volume that we are able to get pretty strong footage from the sky. Um, yeah. And yeah, I would just add too that whether we're on the ground or in the sky, we never ever trespass. 
So <laughs> we always respect, you know, air restrictions. We always, we always film from public roads or from private properties where we have explicit permission to be. Um, so that also then restricts our access. And so in a couple of cases, when there's been really major events like the Aliso Canyon natural gas storage, that, that imagery that we captured was done from a plane. Um, but there are limitations to when that's useful. Yeah. All right. I think we are, might be nearing the end of the, of the questions here. Um, I, I did see one here in the chat box. What is the typical day rate? Ah, thank you. Um, so just to <laughs> emphasize, um, I think Molly mentioned it before in terms of going out to somebody else or going out to a company where you could get a thermographer. Um, but just to emphasize that we don't charge um, for coming out to communities. That's why we have grants and generous donors. Um, we'll never say no to somebody assisting with travel costs or lodging or meals because that really racks up as well. Um, but we're not going to charge a day rate for our thermographers, just to be clear. Um, Ryan, I don't know if you had anything else or if there's any more is, questions. I mean, this has been fantastic. It's uh, 20 minutes over, but there's still <laughs> like almost 40 people that are still attending. Fantastic. Live, you know, Thanks, guys. For the questions. So, yeah, it, I mean, I love that these 30 minute webinars can stay on, on time and then be flexible for for people to really engage and get their questions answered. So also just thank both of you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to prepare a presentation and bring it here to the network. So really appreciate well, it. And thank you to Halt the Harm for all the work you're doing and all the networking you do that got people from across the country on. Yes, and, thank you, Ryan. And thanks to technology that makes it possible. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this has been really fun. Um, you know, we're, we're still, finding the best platform but this uh, crowdcast has been really fun just for getting um you know having this live chat going on and just being able to have everything be pretty easy it allows us to to spin up a webinar every few weeks so we actually have a webinar coming up on public participation in hearings oh. so yeah we're really excited we're having a lawyer come on and jillian from protect pt from protect uh -huh. pen pen trafford is coming on and then Ashley from uh, Mountain Watershed Association is is joining us for that. So everybody who's on the webinar is gonna get an email announcement about that pretty soon in the next like week or so. So that webinar is coming up in early May. And if you're listening and you have a topic that you wanna share, or if you have something that you can share with the network, or even if you just have ideas for webinar topics, I'm gonna drop some links here as well where you can find out more. But also, you can see all of our past webinars on our website, healttheharm.net slash services slash webinars. So let me drop that in the chat, too, because there's some really awesome presentations in here um, for you to check out. So, And the final thing I'll say is a lot of you were thanking us in the chat box, and thank you for your thanks. Um, but for those of you out there who are living on the front lines of this development, um, I'm sorry that you are, and thank you for working so hard and staying interested in the broader issues because it's really, we never, um, we can never say enough about how hard it is out there for all of you. So thank you for your hard work and your, um, and your trying to ship away at this, at the impacts here. And we hope to hear from you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Have an awesome day, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye.